So today we're on the last and then our third part in the series of, uh, called Unfinished Business. As you may remember the first message, uh, Douglas talked about the reason for the Reformation, which was, as you guys probably remember, the spiritual darkness. And then just last week, he talked about the trigger for the Reformation, which was the selling of indulgences. And finally, now we're on our last of the series, we're going to talk about the focus for the Reformation in our days. But before we do that, let's just uh, bow our heads and pray. Dear Father in heaven, I just ask you to be present with us, guide our thoughts, guide our minds, and fill us with your spirit and help us to know how to bring the Reformation into our lives and our community. Amen. So we're going to start our journey in a place not far from where Luther composed the song, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. I don't know if you guys noticed, but we've sang that twice in a row the last two weeks, and we actually will sing it again today at the end. And that song is in here, or in this series, because it was written by Martin Luther. And so this is close to where he wrote that song. It's in an area of Germany called Bavaria. And there's a castle there, and the castle is called Neuschweinstein. And I had to look that up on the internet to try and figure out how to pronounce it. And I still could be wrong. But somebody with an accent pronounced it that way, so I believe them. So does, has anybody, excluding, uh, excluding Junior, has anybody been to Neuschweinstein? Your trip didn't go through Germany at all. Okay, not much. Um, has anybody uh, ever heard of Neuschweinstein? Rodney has, Heather. And do you know any of the connections, anything about it that other people would know? I heard something. It sounds like what? Ice? Oh, like Eisenstein. He may have been there. So the connection that a lot of you would know is, um, there we go. You'll see it here shortly. It's this uh, beautiful castle with this white limestone facade on it. It has these deep blue turrets, even though they look a little bit more rusty to me. But these blue turrets, and it's rumored to be the real life inspiration for the Disney classic Cinderella. Do you guys think it looks like Cinderella's castle? Maybe a little bit, but at least it's rumored to be that the, the inspiration for it. And it, the resemblance does seem to be a little bit striking to me. More than uh, 1.5 million visitors see this castle every year. They specifically go to Bavaria to see a region with a bunch of castles, and this is probably the most memorable one of those castles. I think there are about 7,000 visitors a day um, go through there, so you don't actually get to spend a lot of time. Dur um, Junior did some taping um, previously. I think he was taping his father-in-law, he said. Um, but he got to wander around there at night when there was nobody there. And he said it was even actually a touch creepy at night. But uh, still neat to be there without the 7,000 visitors. There's probably not many places on Earth, especially you add in the castles, beautiful, but you add in those, the foothills and the mountains. There's probably not a lot more places on Earth that look more idyllic and kind of almost like plucked out of a storybook than this Neuschweinstein castle. But the story behind it is less idyllic. The construction became in, uh, began in 1869 um, by Ludwig II, and he planned for it to be completed in about three years. But after it got started, he wanted it to be so perfect, and he was actually so involved with the details that people said uh, that he was the architect as opposed to the people that actually were the architects, because he was really involved. So even after he died in 1886, it still wasn't finished, and it actually still isn't to this day. Despite his grand plans for the castle, only 14 rooms are currently finished, and if you took one of those tours, you would get to view a few of them. You could view the, the grotto, the king's bedroom, singer's hall, and a few more. So Ludwig never saw the completion of his castle, and it makes you wonder, how would it feel if you never saw the completion of something that was super important to yourself? And that's what I want you guys to think about, is this exact question. How would you feel if you never saw the completion of an important goal or project in your life? So in your stations, if you guys want to just talk about that with each other for two minutes. Something super important to yourself, a big goal or project.
when I think about projects or things that I haven't completed, probably the most one that really sticks out of my mind is for years I've wanted to build a rock climbing wall of some sort in my house. And I've, I've done the parts that are easy. I've thought about it, I've read about it, I've bought rock holds, I bought a pile of plywood, and I still have a pile of plywood and rock holds and thoughts in my head. And it's a project that, as I was sitting there thinking about it while you guys were talking, thinking, man, I really need to finish that before my kids are gone, because by the time they're gone, I don't know if I'll be able to use it. So, so that's a project that, that I have left behind. Now, another project that, um, that never got completed, at least not to his satisfaction, is uh, the work of Luther. He felt a lot of discouragement and disappointment after uh, years of work. He continued to teach at Wittenberg throughout um, his life, and at the end of his life, in his last lecture, the words that he ended with are, I am weak and I cannot go on. So the question is that we're going to really think about today is who can go on? Who can finish that work? But a little more about Luther. So Luther set out on a trip, uh, January 17, 1950, sorry, 19, wow in 1546 to his birthplace, which was Eiselben. Although he was really weak with illness, he went to settle a dispute among some counts. <coughs> the negotiations ended successfully. However, he ended so weak and tired that he wasn't able to return home. And he ended up dying about a month later there in Eiselben. And on his deathbed, he prayed. Let's see if I can get it up here. Into your hands... I command my spirit. You have saved me, Father, you faithful God. And after the coffin was displayed there for a number of days in Ethelben, Luther's body was carried to Wittenberg, and he was finally laid to rest in the castle church. And that castle church was the very church where he had nailed his 95 thesis on the, on the door of the church, and where he had also preached for many years from that same pulpit. So, He's weak, he cannot go on, so someone must go on. And that's what we talked about a lot, uh, Douglas talked a lot about last week, is someone must go on, must carry on this uh, Reformation process that Luther started. So I want you to think about that while we watch a, a video together here. On October 31st, 1517, a German monk stood on biblical convictions against the Roman Catholic Church and its leaders. Through this man, a movement was born, a reformation was born, a revolution was born. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. There I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that by which the righteous lives by a gift of God namely by faith. As this monk stood before the church leaders, he planted his feet firmly upon the unchanging truth of God's word and put his life on the line for the sake of the gospel. I am bound to the scriptures I have quoted and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not retract anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. Once eclipsed by a dark cloud of superstition and church politics, the light of the gospel began to shine again. The truth was affirmed that mere men are not the agents of reformation, but servants and stewards of God's reformation, of God's word. A most pernicious error widely prevails that scripture has only so much weight as it's conceded to it by the consent of the church, as if the eternal and inviolable truth of God depended upon the decision of man. Throughout the years, the church was reminded that against the steadfast forces of a lost and dying world, faithful men must continually reform according to scripture, always leading the church back to the immovable foundation of the gospel. The old truth that Calvin preached, that Augustine preached, that Paul preached, is the truth that I must preach today, or else be false to my conscience and my God. From century to century, the battle has raged on. But through the relentless defenders of the gospel message, the church continues to hold her ground. Reformation doesn't mean scrapping the whole of the Bible and putting up your own ideas and theories. It means the exact opposite. It means returning to the Bible. Every Reformation has been a return to the New Testament. That is the only hope tonight. 
and in this present age. Today, the gates of hell continue to wage war on the precious truths brought back into the light in the 16th century. With contemporary challenges arising from within and without the church, the need for reformation is as great now as it ever has been. We now find ourselves on the underside of a moral revolution unprecedented in human history. And as long as there are departures from biblical truth, we must continue to reassert the call to faithfulness that was famously proclaimed 500 years ago. Until Jesus comes again, the Reformation is never over. The church must be, it must always be, reformed according to the Word of God. So another question that we ask is, how can we continue the Reformation today? And, and when I was trying to think about that, I tried to think back to the first series of, that Douglas had on the Reformation, where he talked about the five solas. And I'm not sure if you remember the five solas, but kind of the, the beginning found, uh, foundation and the groundwork of the Reformation. So maybe that's something to keep in mind. Maybe not. But what I'm going to give you is three minutes now to talk about how we can continue the Reformation today and whether or not those five solas help you or not. Any, take any way you want on it, but chat in among your stations about the Reformation today. I'm sure you guys had lots of interesting thoughts, and it'd be great to talk about more. Um, we sometimes have open time where we can share what the group's discussed, but we need to get to Sunnyside, so we're going to carry on today and save those discussions for later. So Archbishop Dr. Musa Pansy Philibus, he's the president of the Luther World Federation, he is addressing something called a synod, uh, which maybe is like our general conference session, I'm not sure, um, in Bonn, Germany. And that was just a little bit ago, November 
9 to 11 of just this year. And what he said is, uh, the Reformation must continue as the living experience of the people of God. Both the church and the world desperately need leaders that take more seriously their responsibility to care for the people they are called to, called to lead, and, to, and do not misuse their positions for selfish ambitions. We are called to seek the lost, reach out to the people who are brutalized, discriminated, violated, undermined, and violently dismembered. Liberated by God's grace, we are bound to Christ as agents of liberation in a broken world to feed the people with God's truth, living examples of what we preach and teach. Now that's, uh, I, I don't disagree with anything it says there, but it's kind of a long thing and a kind of bit of a mouthful at times. And sometimes I wonder if that maybe possibly needs just a tiny bit of simplification. And I think we'll maybe can simplify that shortly. Uh, a f another famous writer that a lot of us know said, the, the same unswerving adhedren, adherence to the word of God manifested at that crisis of the Reformation is the only hope of reform today. So let's get back to the, to the word. Let's get back to sola scriptura. So John 13, 34 and 35. Let me give you a new command. Love one another in the same way I've loved you. You love one another. This is how everyone will recognize you, recognize that you're my disciples, when they see that the love you have for each other. And when I read that, I really think about uh, what our mission is. And I know you guys have heard it almost every week, but it, it serves reinforcement. The mission of our church is to love God, love all, serve God, and serve all. And that, well, I guess we don't 100% know who wrote John. I think most people think it probably was John. But that love that John talks about, I think, is uh, such an important focus that, uh, that we need to, to keep in mind. Try that again. Uh, my connection may have frozen. If you can just forward to the next one. Awesome. So back to Luther. It was the worst of times, 1527, one of the most trying years of Luther's life. For 10 years since publishing his 95 theses uh, against the abuse of indulgences, Luther had been buffeted by political and theological storms, at times his life actually physically in danger. Luther was deeply disturbed and angry. He suffered from severe depression. On July 6, as friends arrived for dinner, Luther felt an intense buzzing in his left ear. He went to lie down when suddenly he called out, Water, or I'll die! He became cold. He was convinced he had seen his last night. In a loud prayer, he surrendered himself to God's will. With the doctor's help, Luther partly regained his strength, but this depression and illness overcame him again in August, in September, and December. Looking back on those bouts, he wrote to his friend, I spent more than a week in death and hell. My entire body was in pain, and I still tremble. Completely abandoned by Christ, I labored under the vacillations and storms of desperation and blasphemy against God. But through the prayers of the saints, his friends, God began to have mercy on me and pulled my soul from the infernal below. Meanwhile, in August, the plague had erupted in Wittenberg, and as fear spread, many of the townspeople left Wittenberg. But Luther considered it his duty to remain and care for the sick. Even though his wife was pregnant, Luther's house was transformed into his hospital. He watched many friends die, even his son became ill. It wasn't until late November that the epidemic began to abate and the ill began to recover. During that horrific year, Luther took time to remember the 10th anniversary of his publication against the indulgences, noting the deeper meaning in his title, the only comfort against raging Satan is that we have God's word to save the soul of believers. Sometime that year, Luther expanded that thought into a hymn that he's most famous for, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Our journey of continuing the Reformation will not be easy. We will face many challenges. We know that any time we do God's work, the devil will fight even harder to discourage us. He is mighty to save. He is the author of salvation. He rose and conquered the, the grave. We have absolutely nothing to fear because a mighty fortress is our God. I'd like to ask our worship leaders to come back up and lead us in singing of, uh, of that same hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
in heaven we just want to thank you so much for so many things we want to thank you for your gift of salvation we want to thank you for the bible the chance that we have to directly go to it and discover what your word says and not rely on what others interpret it we want to thank you for community for friends and those that love us and care for us ask us to take that love and show it to others around us show it to the community and be shining lights of your love in your name, amen.